Hey there, folks. Just wanted to give you a quick shot right quick. WebDM will have our first Kickstarter go live next week on June 9th, and that will be for the Worlds of WebDM present Weird Wastelands. So if you follow the link, it will take you to the Kickstarter watch page where you can follow our project and learn some details about it, and you will know the second it goes live, and you can support us so we can support your exploration pillar at your table. So check it out, and we hope you enjoy. Hey there, fellow Dice Millionaires. I'm Pruitt. This is Jim Davis. And your players see you rolling. They hating. They're trying to catch you DM and dirty. Your monsters are so loud. They swinging. And they're going to catch you DM and dirty. But we're going to teach you to DM even dirtier today on WebDM. Dirtier. This episode is brought to you by Dungeon Fog. They're holding a special event starting June 5th, the Game Masters Workshop. This year's topic is how to create a kick-ass campaign. And they're teaming up with World Anvil, How to Be a Great GM, and Mapmaker Gaora to bring you a two-day system agnostic online event to help Game Masters of all abilities create intriguing campaigns with exciting settings and engaging encounters. It's a great opportunity to workshop your skills, give feedback to others, and get feedback on your own world building. Visit circleofworldbuilders.com for more information. Link in the comments and description. All right, Jim, we've already gotten dirty uh, with our DMs here. We don't want to do them dirtier, but we want them to fight dirtier. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we do. Yes, yeah. We, yeah, we do. We do want them to fight dirtier. And, and I think that that's perfectly fine to be able to, uh, uh, to fight dirtier. The players have a lot of options at their disposal. Characters pretty powerful in 5th edition and... Uh, perhaps mm -hmm. the enterprising DMs out there, both uh, veterans or uh, new alike, would like some more tips on how to surprise their players uh, and catch them off guard uh, in the challenges and the like that they uh, they put forth in their game. And so, uh, much mm -hmm. like our first show, DMs Guide to Fighting Dirty, um, you know, we're we're coming from a place where we're taking full advantage of the exceptions based rules design of Fifth Edition, the idea that there's mm -hmm. a blanket rule that covers something. And then exceptions to that rule are exceptions to that rule and can do whatever they want. Um, and, and we're looking for ways to like challenge the, uh, the, the characters and the players, right? Like this is a one, two punch here, uh, by, by moving beyond like doing as much damage as we can or imposing levels of exhaustion and thinking of their whole character sheet as up for grabs in terms of what we can and can't, uh, you know, present challenges for to vary things up, keep the game interesting and, and to surprise them. But sometimes it is fun to catch your people off guard. Yeah. Uh, especially when, especially when it comes to our, our first, uh, our, our first area here. Uh, like you said, last time we were talking more about the character sheet and proficiencies and all that fun stuff. Now let's get yeah, to one of the on big ones, now, yeah. one yeah. of the big ones. Uh, because uh, anyone can see that this is uh, an issue in the game, and that is vision yeah. and perception. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so, so first <laughs> off, <laughs> there's, there is a, a cliche mm -hmm. in D&D in &D now that everybody has Be dark gone. vision. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the only reason that is, it, the only reason it's overblown in a cliche is because like 75% of the races have dark vision. Yeah, so, and, and like the dungeons, which are in the, the title of the game, are typically uh -huh. dark, and that's part of what makes them scary and, and places to have yeah. adventure. And so, the and a lot of the published materials don't factor in dark vision in their descriptions of places or things like that. So it's like light levels, how far you can see, where you can see, what you can see, play like a mm -hmm. really big role. You know, you're... you're you are the character's eyes and ears. You portray their sensory information to the player so they can make decisions and the like, right? And so thinking in terms of what the characters see is often a really important skill as a dungeon master. And that means you can do a lot of fun things with that uh, in, in terms of presenting challenges, challenges and obstacles. So starting with obscurement, uh, what counts as lightly obscured, uh, you know, according to the base rules that just give disadvantage on uh, perception checks. Um, there's also heavily obscured, which creates areas, uh, sort of basically the blind condition. And, you know, from there, the different levels of light, bright, dim, and darkness, like 
all of those things can be messed with. What counts as lightly obscured? What counts as heavily obscured? Maybe you're cursed by, uh, uh, you know, some <laughs> warlock or something to basically treat your entire vision as if it's lightly obscured. Like everywhere you look, no matter where you look, no matter what you do, light levels, you're always looking at lightly obscured areas, which like means that there are things in the game that can hide in that light obscurement from your sight. You know, um, mm -hmm. similar with like the fact that, um, you know, darkness creates an area of, of essentially like heavy obscurement. Dim light downgrades that, lets them, you know, lets you be able to see in it. Like changing up the details of how that works, how far out that they can see, what triggers this, you know, like it's one thing to just say, like, yeah, this darkness is darkness. Your dark vision does not work with it. It's utter dark. It's absolute dark. You know, it, it doesn't have to be from a spell or something like that uh, for you to just be able to say, like, down here in the dungeon, this is a different kind of darkness, period. And and then from there, you can start adding other things to it if you'd like. You can add fear effects or or <laughs> spend too much time in this darkness and you get this flaw uh, kind of thing to represent more supernatural forms of darkness. Number one, it gives, like, the warlock who took that one invocation <laughs> an, another reason mm -hmm. to to feel uh feel smart uh feel and... superior. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right but it's a way to bring back some of that like the fear of of the darkness that fifth edition has just inadvertently kind of taken away because so many creatures have uh have dark vision yeah because i mean the thing about the darkness like is that not like man's oldest, like, like enemy, it, like right. <laughs> the darkness itself? Like the, we, you know, we created the first technology or at least, uh, uh, or at least commandeered it from a lightning strike or something that being fire <laughs> oh, to sure, beat yeah. back this age old enemy. Right. And I'm sorry, but damn it. I remember in second edition, even though I was playing an elf all the time, we were scared shitless when we were in dungeons. Sure. Like yeah. it was terrifying. Who had the torches? What happens when mm -hmm. those torches, you know, when the DM would roll that D six to see what happens when the torch gets dropped, if it goes out or not. And are we fighting yeah. in complete darkness? Because, right. you know, it's like, Oh, well I have low light vision. If there's no light, then I don't have vision. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what some people kind of forget. Like, like, like in dark, like, like modern dark vision, you just kind of see, it doesn't really matter. And, right, and yeah. I, I miss, I, I'm not gonna lie. I miss the old like differentiation between dark vision and low light vision and sure. Yeah. Having a little more yeah. nuance to it. I don't see why a, like a DM couldn't reintroduce that if the players were amenable. Right. Absolutely. Like, hey, absolutely. I've assigned some of these races to have low light vision instead of dark vision because they live on the surface and yeah, they're better adjusted at night, but they're not like underground you know, because that was the kind of the dividing line, right? Is yeah, yeah, if you were above ground, right you usually yeah. had low light. If you were below ground, you had dark vision or infravision. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's one of those things where, like, in making the game easier to deal with, you're just, all you're doing is, is pushing aside impediments, <laughs> like, of play that yeah. are, should be there and make yeah. the game more interesting. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's, yeah. it, <sighs> I don't know. It's it. How much, how interesting would pitch black be if everybody could see in the dark and not just Riddick? I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think what you're, what you're, what you're identifying there and that, that kind of, uh, a, a flattening out of a lot of the things that go on in D and D is, is a space that fifth edition DMs can step into and say, all right, like, what if I, what if I made this different? What if I tried something different here? Maybe I have a spell that creates light only for people with dark vision, right? Mm. Like it lets the people with dark vision see, but for every, if you don't have dark vision, it's still, it's still dark. Can't see anything, right? Just saying like, hey, you can only see 30 feet, you know, like period. Doesn't matter, bright, sunny day, clear, open, you know, no, <laughs> nothing obscuring you, no, nothing blocking your line of sight. Like you've just been cursed or, uh, or something to only be able to see 30 feet. Uh, and, and limiting that, how far character can see, which baseline rules, character can see about two miles, uh, <laughs> unobstructed according to the DMG. So, uh, you know, messing around with that as well can be an interesting thing. Like 
if you're mm -hmm. in a dungeon and your vision is limited to like five feet, how does that change the parameters of a combat encounter or an exploration encounter or something like that? You know, you're in yeah, underwater. Yeah, all that. <laughs> That's murky. You just can only see that far, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, having that texture pop in like that, it's just going to be distracting, yeah. you know? Like, it really is. It really moving. is going to go. <laughs> All that clipping. Imagine a, a vision curse. Vision, imagine a vision curse, Jim, like called like clipping, like where you get yeah. stuck. Like if you look too long at a wall, you get stuck in that wall or something uh, like that. Yep. Like start throwing in video game uh, uh, quirks. Um, <laughs> sorry, just getting a little bit silly. But you know just what? We do like to get silly. Uh, and guess what? If you go over to Patreon and support us over there, you get a whole other podcast where we're about an hour and a half long every week. We get just as silly. So. Maybe check that out. Maybe don't. Hey, it's up to you. Uh, but uh, coming on back, let's let's get moving on. Uh, getting this, uh, getting even even dirtier, um, because this is the the one thing that people don't like having their having messed with is is their sleep and their rest. They really and, don't. They really. <laughs> oh man, I, I and I can attest personally. Sleep deprivation is a major B. And uh, oh sure, and so it certainly is. So. <laughs> Oh, but, you're talking about real life, not D and D. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I uh, levels of exhaustion. That 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 shit is real. Okay, you get some real right. sleep deprivation. <laughs> you understand what it means? Like, oh yeah, I'm getting I'm getting disadvantaged on all these rolls. No wonder all I suck today. So <laughs> it sucks. Yeah, yeah. But um, but you're right. Resting is one of those uh, uh, things that no one wants messed with. And and like uh, of everything that I think we we talked about in these you know guide to fighting dirty this one might be the most like hot button because there isn't a, a play assumption of the the ability to regularly take rests and by this we mean short and mm -hmm. long rests right not just your character going to sleep and and that's what your character abilities key off of the refresh rates the spell slot refresh rates a whole bunch of stuff uh when they recover hit dice how they get rid of exhaustion levels and so i think they're across a lot of play styles there is sort of an assumption that regular rests are something that will be relatively available there there's all sorts of spells and abilities that that guarantee that or that you know uh prevent the dm from sort of messing with you or denying you those things and mm -hmm. in many ways the game is sort of balanced around and assumes this sort of regular cycle of rests you know even if you're using like the you know the gritty healing or the long you know rest variants that are uh that are in the dmg or playing with something like adventures in middle earth like the way that they change those rests are, are there for you know to, to achieve a desired effect or tone but even taking like baseline rests by the book being able to say like yeah here now in these conditions a long rest is not possible right just like i'm like i'm sorry you're you're out here in the middle of the you know the howling frozen tundra with blizzards raging around you or whatever like I, long rest just isn't going to be possible like you either need something like a tiny hut or um or there's like a magical effect or something that's preventing even that from uh from from working and providing you shelter in this place at this time and so i think if you're gonna change when and where rests can happen and how often the party can uh can enjoy them like you need to be really clear about like why it's happening, you know, what the party can do uh, to to prevent that or to uh, sort of endure it uh, while it lasts, because this is such like a, a core part of the play experience of being able to say, yeah, I'm gonna take a short rest, yeah. you know, just take a breather or camp here for the night or whatever, you know? Yeah. Especially that warlock. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. But, yeah. Certainly. But. The thing is, though, when it comes to resting, like not having the right conditions or just assuming the right conditions are there is, is something that I think that happens with players all the time. Yeah. Like they yeah, need yeah. a rest. All they all they're like is, well, uh, OK, well, we're going to take a quick rest right here yeah. uh, without it taking any kind of uh, look around, um, you know, scope out the place. Do you need to put right. an alarm down? You know, <laughs> like, you know. And I'm not saying that a DM should just, you know, start rolling up a random encounter every single time they take a res. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I mean, having some kind of mechanic, if they are still in a dangerous area 
it's that that should be that should be though i mean if they've been mm-hmm. tra- you know trolloping around making all kinds of noise getting in fights that attracts yeah. things that attracts right. carrion it attracts other predators who are like hey yeah. there's some action over there maybe something's hurt and injured you know and now they're resting a short time away from that covered in the smell and blood and viscera right. as they're cleaning it <laughs> off like this is how nature works. And so sure. it might be hard if you try to take a rest right after a combat. And that should be yeah. hard to do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's perfectly appropriate for DMs to, you know, in a in, an adventure environment like a dungeon or a raid or, or whatever, you know, that that limiting access and availability of rests is is part of that specific challenge of getting through that and navigating that environment. Like when when I think a step back and, and think about resting and, and how often and under what conditions more broadly, I can think of some ways to mess with rests that aren't quite so binary, like, yes, you can, no, you can't. But like, one of the things that I've used is, is a cursing and, uh, uh, <laughs> cursing someone to be, have to spend a certain amount of gold per day in order to enjoy the benefits of rest, right? The idea being mm-hmm. that they're, they have to live an extravagant aristocratic lifestyle wherever they are. Whatever they're doing, they have to live that yeah. lifestyle in order to rest. Are you are you out in the middle of nowhere? Then you, then you are like glamping. You've got a pavilion. You had to bring a staff of people with you. You got to eat mm-hmm. like you banquets, which requires you to store that food and transport it. Like you travel with a giant entourage wherever you go because of this curse. Because like you need a good night's sleep. You can't just like rough it in a in a spell dome, you know, <laughs> what are you? <laughs> you, yeah, know? you can't fit my, your double king size down comforter bed. I can only sleep a... on my special Griffin feather bed. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like that. You ever felt Griffin feather? You know how soft yeah. it is? You know how soft it is. It's the only way I can re- <laughs> regain hit dice. Um, have you ever been and... <laughs> snuggled by an air elemental? I have. That's what it feels yeah. like. <laughs> right, right. I, I, I summon a bunch of invisible servants to hold me aloft while I sleep. Um, and so, like, those are the kinds of things that I think you can you can do to just like make life a little interesting uh, uh, for the players. But this is one to be careful with, uh, I think, because sleep and refreshing those uh, uh, those character abilities are an important part of uh, every PC's uh, uh, well being. <laughs> mm-hmm. But yeah, that uh, any kind of anything that messes with that though is uh, top notch. Yeah. top notch for me. Right, but, you might only need to do it once or twice for everybody to be really remember what was going on, <laughs> really remember that session. <laughs> yeah, well, but but um, you know that that last little curse you were talking about kind of dovetails into uh, our next point. It's like you don't have to just mess with sleep in that way. Like, yeah, there are all kinds of daily needs like that people have. You know, with like food and drink. Uh, And all of that, that if you just, you know, the right curse, the wrong disease, you know, however you want to frame it, um, Mm -hmm. whether it's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, hell, these could be just weird oaths that they get put upon the players uh, for X reason, you know, are they trying to, trying to gain the favor of a certain local spirit? Are they trying to get the, uh, uh, whatever, doesn't matter what it is. Implementing one of these is just, you know, however you want to instill the condition on them. That's great. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, but messing with their food and drink, and you've talked about this one a lot lately, and I love this kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, I, I, I kind of like this one, because these are based on some pretty obscure rules from Wilderness Survival and the PHB and, and the DMG. You know, how much food a, a character needs to, to eat per day, how much water they need to drink, uh, things like that. A lot of this is hand-waved away. Uh, there's a lot of class abilities and, and spells and the like that, that uh, address this very thing, but even without those, I think there's a lot of groups out there that just kind of ignore this and don't really think about it. And I like thinking about it because it's a fun way to introduce like some of that supernatural background to the game. You can tie like certain low level or, or, or low powered benefits to what the characters eat or drink, where they sleep, how they sleep, the way that they live their lives. Right. Like if you're looking for a way to show like, okay, the, the ghosts of this place, you know, the, the undead spirits that stay here, like they have these certain taboos and they might be related to what the characters eat, how often they can drink, when they can drink, in this case, like alcohol, right? Um, you know, wh- how, how do they need to sleep? Is there something they need to do when they sleep in order to 
actually have some sleep. You know, that all of these things are ways to like kind of reinforce the 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 lore of the world as well as just put a little twist on something your players probably aren't really thinking about uh and and to highlight it for a little bit. Um so it might be something like uh in order to gain the favor of the dryads and, and other sylvan creatures of this enchanted forest that you can't you know that you can't eat uh, uh meat you know that you can only eat things that you sort of find and forage uh from a place and therefore you're gonna have to like you know eat the food that's here they don't want you bringing anything with you but you're not gonna be able to hunt uh, or things like that and you could turn that into some sort of skill challenge uh, type thing or mm -hmm. social encounter with uh, whoever has access to the food that they need uh keeping with the theme of sort of like curses one that i've <laughs> used before is like been cursed to have to eat eight pounds of dirt instead of drinking water right and this is a very minor thing in terms of game mechanics but the role-playing uh, opportunities off of it are pretty fun eight pounds of dirt is a lot of dirt you know <laughs> and it's, it's a lot of weight to carry uh, with you. right roughly in weight to about a gallon of water um and and just the idea of a character just like shoving fistfuls of dirt into their mouth in order to alleviate their thirst uh i find enjoyable funny perhaps it's something that an elemental did to them uh just to uh to, to mess with their inner elementals that uh they have inside their body uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh but yeah it, it it could be that you need like 12 hours of sleep a day you know that, that you've just been cursed with with lethargy and you need that much you need 12 hours to get a, to get a long rest you know uh th those are the kinds of things you can do to change things up it's it's not necessarily like combat related but it it mm -hmm. does shake up the assumed things that are going on in the background that the players probably aren't thinking about yeah yeah most definitely um and uh another thing that players um usually don't think about at least in modern day uh with the rise of murder hoboism is reputation yeah, <laughs> reputation is a very uh, is a very important thing um, because if you're playing your world or at least presenting your world in a genuine manner, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if the players are known for just going out and slaughtering everything that they come across, like that's eventually going to start spreading. Like people are going to oh, start yeah. talking about that. Yeah, and you know, yeah. When you have the nice civil folk of the city, and then you have these people come in, their weapons covered in blood, or just, they've been out adventuring for weeks on end, yeah. dragging in a dragon's in head. Town. Oh my. Oh my god. Oh, oh my god. Not, <laughs> like, not these riffraff. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, th I think, like, both in terms of having your, uh, you know, ways that you show how the setting and the campaign reacts to the actions of the party is important, and we've talked about this in many episodes especially about like faction play or running in pcs things like that but i'm talking about just like in terms of the like the extras of your campaign world the nameless npcs the shopkeepers the people they pass by on the street things like that like if your players start to develop a reputation for some undesirable behavior or or whatever like portraying that can be really interesting like having the baseline be that everyone here can't stand you you know <laughs> because mm -hmm. of whatever quality whatever thing i would tie it to something that they did rather than like who they are you know just because i yeah. think that's a more interesting gameplay thing and avoids a lot of like just undesirable situations i just don't want in my games you know mm -hmm. um yeah but we, having it... we sent you to go clear out the ca the catacombs you did that and you also robbed all of our ancestors right right yeah hey. exactly things like that you What's did up? that yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, 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 yeah <laughs> right you know there are times i think where you know you could have a uh situation where it's like oh these people don't like you just because you're a dwarf you know or an elf or something like that but that's a very mm -hmm. group dependent talk to your players first kind of thing uh, uh to to use but yeah like oh yeah you did this thing while out adventuring that we don't like you know we we you know we thought you were doing x you ended up doing y this is the collateral damage that could be one um or it could be like a targeted character assassination, like someone's working behind the scenes to like spread rumors about your characters, to to undermine mm -hmm. the confidence that others have in them. You know, this this is a way to like 
deny access or to cut off access to certain locations or, or people or resources that the party enjoys. Um, it has the benefit of being like purely in setting. Like you don't need to worry about any rules. You don't need to, to, to have them make a saving throw, <laughs> you know, uh, it's entirely the work of, of in game, in fiction, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, machinations and the like. Um, but you could mechanically express it by like changing the DCs that the party needs to, uh, to meet in order to like influence, uh, NPCs with persuasion, uh, or the like, or maybe it's harder to lie to the NPCs because of just what they think about the party. Like they assume you're lying, you know, you're, it's going to be much harder mm -hmm. to actually, <laughs> actually convince them of something that's untrue, uh, in those cases. And mm -hmm. that can be an interesting uh, thread or, or way to come at the party from a more like social or intrigue uh, place. You know, a lot of PCs, they're very powerful in a direct confrontation. You know, like they're, they, they, they go through villains like butter uh, in a lot of ways. And so maybe a, a villain or an antagonist of the party notices that, sees the strength that the party has in like direct confrontation. Uh, and, and decides to get them from a different way, you know, like undermine mm -hmm. the public's trust, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. If your villain, yeah. If your villain is a warlock with like, I don't know, what is it? Mask of many faces. Or mm. if you're, if you just give a villain a hat of disguises and yeah. every time the players come to a new town, they're already reviled because of the things that they've done to that town. Now you right. get to figure out, well, we haven't been here before. And they're and everyone in town's like, oh, no, you were here last week. Oh, yeah. You, you were owe me this week, much yeah. for that fight you started in mm -hmm. the end. Don't even go, yeah. you know, don't even go over to the whatever, the armor smith that you stole from. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you yeah. if you have a villain that wants to, he can take down their reputation without them being there. And uh, they yeah. get to deal with the fallout. Yeah, it's a fun way to use like a doppelganger without the classic, oh, I'm going to try to sneak this party member off to the side without anybody noticing or suspicious, being suspicious mm -hmm. of anything, only to have them, what, betray everyone and kill them all, and cause a TPK. Like, could very well be like, oh, no, we know there's a doppelganger out. There's many of them. There's like as many as the party. And mm -hmm. <laughs> they've been hired by this organization to tarnish our good names, except although there's like five times as many as the party, actually, because they're everywhere. Um, yeah. I, you know, those are, those are, those are situations that I think even like tier four PCs will sweat a bit to try to figure out like, how do we undo the damage from this? How do we stop them? Uh, things like that. It's like, what are we trying to stop? I'm trying to stop a bunch of people talking to each other. You know, that's, that's a tier four challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, trust me. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so, um, so, uh, with regards to all of this, Jim, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, what, is, what would you say as a kind of a, a closing argument, uh, would you, what, what warning would you give to your DMs out there who want to take this advice into consideration? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, play by the rules. Whatever rules you establish, whatever rules your group's agreed to play by, play by those rules. Um, Challenge-based play is most effective in groups that have a high degree of trust with each other. And, and I think that building that trust as a DM, understanding that you're there to be a referee and an impartial arbiter of the game world and the rules and to guide the game along is, is really important. If, you know, if you're a DM that like fudges a lot or changes things up or like nudges the game in certain directions then using some of these tricks and, and uh, tips might come across as unfair or come across as, as sort of like, well, the players can't do anything about it. But if you present the world impartially, you roll in the open, you let the dice fall where they may, then you can do these kinds of things because you've built up that trust in the players that says, you know what, like my DM is fair. Like sometimes we're in tough situations. Sometimes we, it's a cakewalk. Um, and, and if there's something that breaks the rules as a player understands it, you as a DM can say, it's okay. I know that this, I, this was deliberate. There's a way out of this. And this is here to be an enjoyable experience because of the challenge it brings not to like make your life miserable and for you mm -hmm. to hate it. And in that sense, you might step across the line and introduce something that you think is going to be a hit. And people are like, this is bullshit. And you need to be able to walk that back. Right. You need to be able to say, that's my mistake. I let's go ahead and just 
do some retconning, some, <laughs> some rewinding, uh, or find a way to move forward that preserves the fiction of the game without the elements that make it completely unenjoyable for the players. Because um, challenge-based play is, is exciting, keeps the game alive and invigorated, uh, and, and is part of that uh, grand tradition of D&D of, of just trying to pull one over on the players and make them think mm -hmm. about how to get out of this particular bind. Yeah, most definitely. And you don't have to think too hard about this next action, which is being able to hit like and subscribe down there, hit that bell for notifications. Also, there's a link uh, for a mailing list in the comments and description. You want to get signed up for that because we got some big stuff coming out. And uh, yeah, you're going to want to know about that. So have a good one. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.